السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وقال الذين جاء منهما والذكر بعد أمة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقال الذين جاء منهما والذكر بعد أمة أنا أنبئكم بتأويله فأرسلون يوسف أيها الصديق أفتنا في سبع بقرات سمان يأكلهن سبع عجاف وسبع سنبلات خضر وأخر يابسات لعلي أرجع إلى الناس لعلهم يعلمون قال تزرعون سبع سنين دأبا فما حصدتم فذروه في سنبله إلا قليلا مما تأكلون ثم يأتي من بعد ذلك سبع شداد يأكلن ما قدمتم لهن إلا قليلا مما تحصنون ثم يأتي من بعد ذلك عام فيه يغاث الناس وفيه يعصرون رب شحب صبري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد ونسجن أبي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, My hope today is to cover ayahs number 45 all the way to 49 today. I know that's um, rather unusual for the series that we've been having. Usually I cover an ayah, part of an ayah, and we take quite a bit of time for that. But I, after discussing this with uh, Sheikh Suhaib, uh, at some length, we both came to the conclusion that I think it's best that we you know, keep the discussion on these ayah together, round together. And uh, there are some things that are, most things here that are rather self-explanatory. So I think the time will move along quickly. I know we're starting pretty late tonight, but inshallah better late than never. So here it is, uh, let's get started with ayah number 45. This is now, the king has told his dream up to ayah number 44. His advisors have told him that this is adghathu ahlam. One comment, you know, meaning they are jumbled up images. Um, one comment that is peculiar about the language of the ayat, the word for dream that the king used is ru'ya, which is singular, which means vision. Uh, and the word they used is ahlam, which in Arabic can be associated with dreams also. As ru'ya is, but the difference is one ahlam is plural, ru'ya is singular. So he says vision, which he's calling a dream, and they said dreams or visions, plural, right? Then the, the root origin is also different. What he's using is a word that's used for seeing literally also. So ra'a can be used not just for seeing a dream, but as I see something right now, what I see before my eyes is also ra'a. So it's, it's used for in the, in the world of dreams, but also in reality which means that word shares a component of meaning closer to reality. And that's important because when the king saw his dream, he thinks it's something real. He's actually, he's, the way he's describing it is not just some fantastical images, but it's something bothering him enough that this is related to something very real. Something in him is telling him that this is significant, which is why he brought it up. Otherwise, the, a king has no business just bringing up his dreams and talking to his staff about it or, or to his advisors about it. The other interesting thing is ru'ya is um, when you say vision, it's uh, uh, because it's singular, all of what he saw, because he saw seven fat cows followed by seven skinny cows, and then the seven skinny cows are eating the fat ones. Then he saw green stalks. Then he saw dried up ones. So there's a bunch of things that he saw, but he calls all of those scenes one vision. So he thinks all of it is connected in some way. It's one idea in his mind. So he's not describing them as multiple ideas, as one. On the flip side, when the when the, his advisors respond to him, they say, "Wama nahnu ahlami bi We were not good at interpreting multiple scattered images. And hulm actually also has is related to imagination in spoken Arabic. Also, even until today, uh, halama is also used for imagining something or an imagined dream that you may one one you know one day realize, etc. So it has, it's closer to imagination, right? So when they use that word, they're actually saying that these are scattered ideas, they have nothing to do with each other, and they are basically a product of your own imagination. So that's the contrast between the word he himself used for his dream and how his advisors dismissed it. Now, when he says, وَمَا نَحْنُ بِتَأْوِيلِ Or when they say, وَمَا نَحْنُ بِتَأْوِيلِ الْأَحْلَامِ مِنَ uh, we cannot possibly interpret these dreams. We're not knowledgeable in interpreting these kinds of scattered images or, you know, uh, nightmares even. 
وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ جَا مِنْهُمَا And the one of the two that had been saved, the one that survived, not meaning the, the, you know, the two inmates, one of them got executed, the other one survived. Allah is referring back to him now. And the one of the two that had survived and had been rescued said, وَدَّكَرَ بَعْدَ أُمَّةٍ As he made some effort to remember after a, 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 you know, a bunch of time had gone on. So in other words, now he, this guy is in the crowd. Obviously, he's not an advisor. He's the cupbearer. He's pouring the drinks. And he, the king just says a dream. And he's like, hmm. And then they're all listening in. And that doesn't make any sense. It's just a bunch of jumbled images. What about you? No, sir. I don't think it makes any sense. And they're going around. Everybody's saying that these are just, you know, it's just a nightmare you had. Don't think about it too much. You're stressing over nothing. And this guy is pouring the drink. And now Allah says, he spoke up. And the word, what dakara, it dakara is actually in Arabic, tadakara. The word tadhakkara um, is from the tafa'ul pattern. The ta and the dhal from pronunciation. Ta and dha are from the same part of the tongue. Your tongue moves to the front of the mouth when you pronounce them. And what happens is there's a fusion. It's called idgham in, in Arabic. So tadhakkara becomes iddhakkara or iddhakkara. So iddhakkara is the harder pronunciation. And even an easier version of that is iddhakkara. So here, what dakara or uh, actually it's not the dakara, it's if dakara. Sorry, it's if ta'ala. Because there's no shadda on the kaf. So if dakara becomes id dakara. If the da and the ta together become a dal. And so that's an interesting fusion of the word. It actually means to put very little effort in remembering. So it's the same word that's used in the Quran for when Allah challenges us to remember him by his, for, through the Quran. He says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ we made the Qur'an easy for remembrance. فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ Is there anyone that will put an effort to remember? Now what's really interesting about that word is, originally the word is mutadhakkir. Listen to me carefully. mutadhakkir. That's lots of syllables, right? But the ta and the dha are similar. So what the Arabs do is they fuse them and they say there's an easier version of it, mudhakir, which is a shadda on the dhal. But then there's, even the that is hard to pronounce because you have to stick your tongue out. So what's the easiest version of it? Muddakir. Muddakir. So the dal becomes a dal. So there's the original version, mutadakir. There's a slightly easier version, muddakir. And then there's the easiest version, muddakir. Now the rhetorical purpose behind them could possibly be the easiest version means the least amount of effort required. So mutadhakir, someone who puts a lot of effort in remembering. Mudhakir, a little less. Mudhakir, the least bit of effort. And interestingly, the Quran in this case uses what dakara, the dal is used instead of the da, because you know remembrance is anybody, even if you don't know Arabic much, you know that dhikr is the Arabic word for remembrance or memory, right? So it's it's a dal, but instead of what dakara, it's what dakara. What dakara, the dal is used to suggest that it's the least bit of memory that it took from him. It, it took us the slightest nudge for him to remember, meaning it wasn't very hard to remember Yusuf alayhi But in, then Allah uses ba'da ummatin. So this guy who's the, you know, the one who was saved is pouring the drink and he's about to speak up. We don't know what he's going to say yet. But Allah adds ba'da ummatin. Now the word ummah, I, I think here people know, you guys listening know, ummatun muslima, Muslim ummah. The ummah of, of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ummah is a word for nation. But ummah is actually also a word for a time, uh, you know, a, a unit of time. So ila ummatin ma'duda and elsewhere in the Quran until a limited time. And what's the connection between a nation and ummah? Imam Razi tries to make the connection and say sometimes the Arabs in the ancient times used the word ummah for time because an ummah, a nation, is a bunch of people together, and an ummah in time could be a bunch of days together, a bunch of months together, a bunch of years together, right? So. This phrasing suggests after a whole bunch of years, because we, how do we know it's years? Because already Allah told us that he remained in prison with Asinin, a number of years, right? So after a whole bunch of years went by, months went by, all of a sudden it took very little for him, for him to remember. It was very easy for him to remember the ease of it inside what dakara. Now, before I translate this for you, he's pouring the drink. He got the good news that he's going to be saved, remember? And now the king is asking, you know, Nabbi'uni. I mean, I'm sure you read the king's words because it's important. When he, Aftuni uh, fi give me a fatwa. Give me a fatwa about my dream. That's what the king had said. Give me a fatwa means give me a judgment. Give me a 
judgment. Now, they said, we can't interpret it. <clears throat> that was their response. This guy, when he's going to respond, he's going to say, check this out. He says, Ana unabbi'ukum bita'wili. I will inform you of what it means, of what is, what is behind it. I'm the one who will inform you. Okay? He knows he's not the one who's going to inform him. Who's going to be informing? Yusuf alayhi salam. He could just say, I know someone. Right? Or I met someone who's really good at this. He's not saying any of that, is he? He's saying, and he, the uh, I is actually mentioned twice. Ana unabbi'ukum. In fact, I, I shall inform you. <clears throat> There's a I twice here. Once in the verb, once as the pronoun before. It's as, as if to say I and no one else. Let me tell you, I have, excuse me, I, I think I can totally do this. And by the way, interestingly, he's pouring the drink for the king. So you can imagine he's right next to the king as he's talking, right? He's not in the back somewhere. And when he's pouring the drink and everybody else is being dismissed, he didn't just talk to the king. He said, Ana unabbi'ukum bita'wilihi. I can tell all of you what it means. I can inform all of you what it means. So it's interesting that he, first of all, he's not just talking to the king. And right now they were all talking and dismissing the dream. And now he's trying to look good in front of the king and one-up these ministers. All in this, all in one shot by saying, Ana unabbi'ukum bita'wilihi. But on a subtle note, I want you to appreciate something about word usage in the Qur'an. There are two words so far that we've got, two main words. There's a third minor term, but let's go to the two main words. The two main words are fatwa, ifta, meaning give me a judgment. And the other is inform me, nabbi'ni. Okay? And th these two words keep getting used for dreams. Now, when these young men went to... Yusuf alayhi salam. They said, inform us. Inform us. Nabi'na. Right? And then later on, aftina. So give us, the, give us a judgment. So they use the words interchangeably. What are the two words? Inform us and give us a judgment. Now, it sounds like, inform me about what this dream means. Give me judgment about what this dream means. Sounds like the same thing. But actually, there's a little tiny subtle difference. When you say, if you ask me to inform you about something, then it could be that I get the information from somewhere else and give it to you. If I say, inform me of the time, then I could check the time and then give it to you. But if you say, give me your judgment about what time I should go, am I going to go check somewhere else or am I the source of the answer? I'm the source. When you ask for my judgment, then I'm the source. If you ask me to inform you, then you also know I might be the source or I might get the information somewhere else. Isn't that the case? Now, in the sense of you coming and asking somebody, tell me, inform me what this dream means, judge for me what this dream means, right? Then you are saying that this person knows themselves. But look at what the Quran does. They asked Yusuf salam to inform them. Yusuf alayhi salam responds, before lunch comes to you, nabba'tukum bita'wilihi, I will have informed you. Informed. He didn't say, I'll judge it for you. He said, I will what? Inform you. Why? Because he's not the judge of what this dream means. Who's the judge of what it means? Allah azza wa And Allah reveals that to him, and that's why he can tell them, right? He's actually not the judge. Who's doing the fatwa on the dream? Allah is. And at the very end, at the very end of him telling them all this dream, you know what he said? This is the dream, alladhi fihi tastaftiyan. This is the one about which is, whose judgment you were seeking. The judgment that you were seeking is this. He didn't say, I've judged it for you. He said, the judgment you were seeking is this. And then he said, qudhi al-amr, the matter has been decided. He didn't say, I decided it. He said, the matter has been decided, suggesting who decided it. Allah has. Allah has decided the matter about which the unabbi'ukum bita'wili. I'll inform you of what it means. Oh yeah? Where are you going to get the information, huh? Fa'arsiluni. Therefore, send, for, send me. I know where to get the information, sir. Can I, if, if you can just give me a little bit, can I just go and get the information for you? I know where to get it. I don't have it. I can inform you of it if you just let me go. 
Okay, let me just finish pouring this orange juice for you and I'm out of here. And I'll get it for you. He's not telling the king where he's getting it from. He's still, who, who did he bring up again? فَأَرْسِلُونِي Send me. You see, if this, rewind, what do we know about this guy? What we know about this guy is he was in prison. He asked Yusuf alayhi salam for help. Yusuf alayhi salam interpreted his dream, gave him good news that he's going to get out. That dream came true. The only thing Yusuf alayhi salam asked is, hey, if you get a chance, just could you just mention me when you get a chance? Cool. Yeah, yeah I'll do that. Did he do that? No, Shaitan made him forget. We talked about that, right? Shaitan made him forget for many years. He has no idea or, or no concern about Yusuf alayhi salam. Finally, there's a problem of dream interpretation. And this guy, during his pouring of the cup, should be going, ah, dream interpretation? Oh my God, I forgot my friend Yusuf. That the shaitan made me forget. This is like the best time to bring him up. It's like, you know, the in the, in the pagan tradition, the stars have aligned for me to bring him up. It's the, it's the most golden opportunity. What better time to say, hey, I need someone who can help you with this is actually in jail and he was falsely imprisoned too. So he might, might as well get his case heard too, right? Did he bring any, him up at all? No, he said, I'm the one who can inform you. So send me. What he could have said is, I know someone who can inform you, so send for him. Couldn't he do that? Easy to say. And all Yusuf was asked was, just bring me up. Just say my name, that's all. Just bring me up. He didn't even say, tell people I interpret dreams or nothing. Else. Just mention me. It didn't take much for him to remember Yusuf salam's talent and skill, but apparently it was too much for him to mention Yusuf salam, isn't it? The question then arises, why? You see, in the previous ayah, we talked about how the king's advisors, his chiefs, his generals, didn't want to look bad in front of the king. So instead of saying, we don't know how to interpret that, they said, what you saw was nonsense. So instead of acknowledging, I don't know enough, I'll just say your question is stupid. Right? That makes you look bad instead of me. If I, if I say, I don't know, then it makes me look bad. But if it's your question's ridiculous, then it makes you look bad. So I can flip, I can flip the script on you. This guy, on the other hand, instead of looking bad, he sees an opportunity to look real good. I mean, I got out of jail, I'm pretty lucky. And now I work for the king, and now I have an opportunity to score this interpretation for the king, because the king really wants it. And I can go and get this interpretation, and once I bring it over, oh, the promotion I'm going to get. Oh, please send for me. I'll get the answer. I'll get it. Why? Because he wants the credit. He wants, the, he wants that, that advantage, right? Everybody's got to move up, right? You know, in the corporate world, those of you that work in the corporate world, everybody's trying to cut everybody else. And if they can take advantage, they'll be real nice to you because they want your help because they know you get the job done that they can't do. And once you get it done, they take all the credit. This is, this is the ayah about like corporate ladder right here. Fa'arsilun, <laughs> send me. Don't give credit in your report. Hey, could you help me with this presentation? Put the whole thing together. Great job, Smith. Great job with the report. Thanks, did it all by myself. And you're just looking at him like, you, you didn't do that, but you made me do it. And I thought I was a personal favor or whatever, but you, now you took my position and moved up. You see? So now he says, send me. And what's not been mentioned is, so he was sent forward. Now, he, when he mentions this and he says this, I believe the guidance from this ayah really is to understand characters like that. Sometimes you genuinely help people and you don't ask for much in return. Right? But, and it's, Allah already said shaitan made him forget. But even when shaitan failed to make him forget and he actually remembered, he still didn't want to remember, did he? Then other motivations came in the way. Right? So it could be that you genuinely help someone. It could be like that. But even when they have the opportunity to do, good, to do good by you, that will cost them nothing. Nothing but just being honest. Don't expect it in return. Don't expect what you, you know, oh, well, I did so, good, so much good to them, then maybe they'll return that good back to me. It doesn't work that way. And if you start thinking that way, you will lose your motivation to be good to people. Because you'll keep expecting that they'll give you back and you'll keep hitting disappointment after disappointment and then you'll end up telling yourself, what's the point of me being good to anybody? I don't want to help anyone. Everybody's looking out for themselves anyway. This is why when we do good, we don't do good for another. We do good first because it's an act of worship. Allah has given me the opportunity to do, to do good and this person that's coming to me is an opportunity sent by Allah that is being written for me. That's all. And once it got written, my part is that I'm happy not because they got helped, 
I'm first happy because it got written for me. That's it. I have no expectations in return. And when that happens, Allah might surprise you with return, but that return came not with your expectation, you see. This is the same attitude when we give charity. This is the same attitude when we help somebody. This is the same attitude when we teach somebody. You know, in old Arabic, they have this like, there's two readings of this poem. وَعَلِّمُهُ الرِّمَايَةَ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ فَلَمَّا اسْتَدَّ سَاعِدُهُ رَمَانِي You know, وَكَمْ أُعَلِّمُهُ مِنْ نَظْمِ الْقَوَافِ فَلَمَّا قَافِيَةَ قَالَ قَافِيَةً هَجَانِي uh, Another reading of it is اشْتَدَّ سَاعِدُهُ So they, they say, uh, I taught him archery every single day. You know archery, right? bow and arrow, hit the target. I, ta I taught him how to hit the target every single day, the poet says. And when his strike got perfect, he shot me. That's this next line. And he says, and how many times did I teach him how to make poetry right? Because the poetry is when you say a line and it's got a certain number of syllables and the next one has to have the same number of syllables. How many days I practiced with him to make his rhymes perfect. And when his rhymes got perfect, the first poem he wrote was to diss me. <laughs> That's the poem. And what's the point of that poem? Are you do good to someone and they turn their tables on you, right? But that's the worst case scenario. But in, at, the, at the best, in the, at the very least, you could have just mentioned me. No, don't expect that either. You could say it, but it's just let it go. Even if you ask for someone's help, just know that if they decide to help you, then that's a favor from Allah, but not something you and I deserve. Or you and I ex sh should expect. Just let expectations from people go a little bit. We're, we're talking about favors. We're not talking about let expectations from your employees go or let expectations, expectations from your children go or your students go. There are people that you have rights over them and they better fulfill their obligations. That's different. If I paid somebody to do a job, I can't say I let it go. It's in the hands of Allah. No, no. It's in the hands of Allah, but I am paying you until the job gets done. That's, that's different. But well, we're talking about asking favors, right? When, when, when you start, when you, if you ask a favor and it happens, sometimes you want a favor, sometimes you ask for help, but if you don't get it, it's okay, not the end of the world. You don't have to worry, you know, and it could be there's different reasons. One reason, shaitan made them forget. That already happened. The other reason, if, even if shaitan didn't make them forget, their motivations changed. Like they saw maybe that helping you might compromise an opportunity for them to get ahead. In some way, in some illegitimate way, this is an illegitimate way to get ahead, giving yourself credit for something that you don't know. And, but, but people will do that, and that's okay. That's life. Don't get hung up on it. Don't have a grudge about it. Why? Why am I saying all this? Because he will go back to prison, isn't it? After so many years of forgetting Yusuf salam in jail, he's going to go back. And now he's... I want you to imagine yourself. Because, you know, we read Quran, we study tafsir, but we don't understand that first and foremost sometimes this stuff happened. This is real. This guy's real. He said, I'll tell you what it means. Boss, can I go? Go ahead. And why would the king send him? The, the, those guys wouldn't send him because they want to dismiss it. The king is really concerned about this dream. Like, well, whatever, just go ahead, go. If you can bring me something, you know, what do I, what do I have to lose? Except some more orange juice. So go. So now when he's gone, what's going on in this guy's head as he's on his walk to prison? What am I going to tell Yusuf? Um, I did kind of forget to... Yeesh. I mean, he, all he asked for me was to mention him and I, I didn't do that. And now I need his help. With the exact thing he helped me with before, dream interpretation. So I'm going to go back and say, hey bro, I totally let you rot in here and forgot about you. And uh, yeah. But you know, could you help me again? How's, that's not going to work, is it? Maybe I should act like none of this happened and pretend that I owe him nothing. Pretend that I don't even have to apologize for forgetting. I'll act like, wait, did you say mention? I don't remember you telling me that. What are you talking about? I'll pretend that that exchange never even happened. I'll meet him like we're best buddies. And hopefully he'll give me benefit of the doubt and think, Oh my God, he didn't hear me properly. Did I even say that to him? He'll start doubting himself. You see? So he comes to Yusuf in the next ayah. Look at how the ayah begins. He's immediately already in the next ayah. He's already in prison. He's already on the other side of the bars. Yusuf is there. And he goes, Yusuf! Ayyuh as siddiq Yusuf! The great, true, honest guy. The good guy. 
A siddiq actually comes from siddiq, truthfulness. It's a siratul mubalagha, a rare one, fi'il, which means in this case, the guy who's truthful like nobody else. Man, you are honest like nobody else. You are so sincere like nobody else. Siddiq can mean goodness of character, and Siddiq can mean incredibly true in what he says. So it's two pronged. Man, whatever you said was so true. What's, what, what, what could that be referring to? The dream interpretation? But he did spend some time with him in prison. What else could it be referring to? Man, your character, the way you carry yourself, you're such a good guy. You're true in every respect, bro. Yusuf, my real good, true friend, my, the true guy, the truthful guy. Ah, you're so great. <laughs> That's how he starts. And you have Siddiq. It's interesting. Last time when he asked him, they asked him a favor. At the end, they said, Inna naraka min al muhsin. We see you from good people. We, see, we think that you're good. You can help us. He comes back with a compliment first. Why? Because he wants Yusuf Alayhisam to do something for him. And manipulative people, when they want to use you, they will say the nicest, kindest things to you before they ask you for something. And they will stab you in the back with a smile on their face. And du'as for jazakallah khairan. MashaAllah, thank you so much. May Allah reward you. <laughs> right? That's going to happen. This guy comes, Yusuf Ali, Yusuf, Ayuha Siddiq. Like he remembers his name, calls him this truthful, honest person. Then he goes, amazing. Aftina fi sab'i baqara. Let's get right down to business. Uh, I don't have a lot of time. Here's the translation straight up. Yusuf, truthful one. Could you judge for us about seven cows, Sibanin that are fat, that seven skinny ones are eating, and seven green stalks, and other ones are dry? Did he say it's a dream? No. Did he say it's from the king? No. Did he say what this is about? No, bro, I'm in a little bit of a hurry. If people find out that I was asking you. I'm going to get caught. You know this is what this is similar to? Earlier on in the story, remember when Yusuf Alayhisselam was being traded like a, a bartering chip? And the people who first found him wanted to get rid of him real quick before their master found out? Right? So they, they, they got rid of him for a cheap price, quickly. He's like, Yusuf, bro, seven cows, fat, seven skinny, green stocks. Could you, there's no small talk in the middle, just Yusuf, great guy, come here. And quickly, quickly, because he wants the answer quick so he could do what? Get out of there before they find out who he was talking to. He wants it quick. So there's no small talk, hey, it's been a long time, how you been? Man, I put in a good word for you, but they just didn't want to listen, you know. And none of that stuff, no excuses, no nothing. Gets right into it, wants Yusuf Alayhisselam to answer him. And so when he does that, La Ali, and by the way, Aftina. Give us a judgment. Not tell me. He's not saying, I got a dream this time. He knew if he says, man, I see in another dream, you sort of sounds like, okay, I can tell you what it means. How about you go mention me first, then I'll tell you what it means. He could do that, right? He doesn't say, judge for me. He says, judge for what? Us. Now, what's he trying to say? Man, there's a bunch of us really concerned. There's a lot of families concerned. The whole community is concerned. We don't know what us could refer to, right? So it opens up with, hey, this is not just about me. There's people that are really worried. And I think you're a good person. You like to help people. This is, a, this is bigger than you and me, bro. This is bigger than all both of us. Don't, it's not about me. It's not about my own cause. So he's trying to sell it to him as a communal thing because he knows Yusuf salam is concerned about the larger good. Right? That was the AC, by the way. Relax. <laughs> not thunder. <laughs> so... So, so when he says this to him, and he describes the dream, he literally repeats the words of the king, yes? So he repeats the words of the king, not telling him it's from the king. And by the way, it would have been important for Yusuf to know that that's from the king. Because what he should do with that, a king has to take certain kinds of actions, right? Then he says, I'm hoping that I can go back to people so that they could know. Hopefully they'll know. I'm hoping I can go back to who? The people. Is he going to go back to people? He's going to go back to one person. Who's he going to go back to? The king. He could have honestly come and said, La Ali arji'u ila al maliki, la Allahu ya'lamu. So I can go back hopefully to the king so he can know. The king saw this dream. 
He's being dishonest because dishonesty takes many forms. And one of the forms of lying to people is withholding information. Omitting, withholding information is a form of lying. Okay? So if you tell, hey, what did you do today? I ate. That's true, but after you ate, you also did this, 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 and this. There are other things you did. Now, you told the truth when you said, I ate. But when you omit certain other things that you did conveniently, and you skip over three of them and say, and then I slept. Yeah, but in between, you stole a computer. It's on security footage. <laughs> right? When you skip that, that's, a, that's lying too. But I know I told the truth. Is he going to go back to some people? Yeah. Will some people know after he speaks? Yeah. But he's deliberately hiding the facts from Yusuf salam for ulterior motive. Because he doesn't want Yusuf salam to know that he's got the ear of the king. Because if he says that, Yusuf salam could say, so wait, so you serve the king drinks every day for the last few years and you couldn't bring me up once? You, you couldn't do that? I mean, the cub bearer is supposed to be the guy who talks small talk with the king all the time. Right? Well, you look stressed out today, sir. You know, want me to pour some extra for you? They could chat about whatever. You could have brought it up in all this time. He doesn't want to give Yusuf Ali some the opportunity to have that leverage on him. So he says, no, I'm here as a public servant for the larger benefit of the community. I come to you because people may know. Also, the may know mean, so they know, they may know what this dream means. But also, they may know that you're a pretty good guy. Maybe you'll get out of here if they know. So this might help you out too. I'm trying to look out for you, bro. Because if they know, I'll say, where'd you get this interpretation? And I'll tell them it was you. And then maybe you'll get a chance that you've been hoping for. The other interesting thing about this uh, is that he is now telling Yusuf السلام, the way he told him without mentioning that it's a dream. He just got right into it, right? Cows and stalks of grain and all of that. That suggests that this kind of thing was very common. People talking about dreams was a very common thing in society. And people shared that with each other. It's actually almost like, if I were to compare it to something, people nowadays talking about their emotions. Going to a counselor, a therapist, right? Getting some kind of... And back in the day, and even now, of course, when you have a lot of anxiety, when you have a lot of stress, when you're depressed or something, you'll see certain kinds of dreams. And they'll bother you. And you feel the need to talk to somebody. And a lot of times you'll go talk to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a counselor or somebody to help you figure out why am I keep, what do I keep seeing these images? What part of my conscience are they coming from? Right? But back in the day, it wasn't just about psychology. It was more a spiritual, what could, the, what could the unseen world be telling me? Right? And so they were superstitious people in that sense. Now there's a reality to the unseen from a revealed side of things, but they have no access to that. Only a prophet would have access to that. But anyway, so he, he poses this to Yusuf as if it's a public service. In this you find a few things. It's pretty ironic that when he came back, to the, he came to Yusuf he remembered the dream word for word, didn't he? Which is pretty interesting for a guy who forgot to mention one name. <laughs> right? When it comes to it, his memory is perfect. And when it comes to some other things that don't serve his purpose, he forgets. It's remarkable that there's that irony that's shown in this. So now he comes to Yusuf alayhi salam, tells him this dream. Yusuf alayhi salam remarkably has been given revelation from Allah. It seems, and I'm not telling you there's an ayah that said Allah revealed this to him. But Allah azza wa jal, it's already been established in the, in the surah. يُعَلِّمُكَ مِنْ تَعْوِيلِ hadith. Allah will teach you the interpretation of all kinds of speech. As soon as Yusuf alayhi salam heard it, he knew that this is a state of national emergency. And he knew from Allah that this is something that must be put into action immediately. And he knew that it's not one or two people that have to do this. It has to be the entire nation doing it, which means it has to be executed at a governmental level. He knew this immediately. And you can tell he knew this immediately by the way that he responded. By the way, the first time he interpreted a dream, it was for two individuals, yes? Now he's interpreted, and for the benefit of two individuals. Let me qualify that statement. He interpreted a dream for the benefit of two individuals. This time he's interpreting a dream for the benefit of an entire nation. Right? 
Now those two guys, whatever was going to happen to them was going to happen fairly quickly. But he needed to give them da'wah first. Didn't he see the importance of giving them da'wah first? This time it's a national emergency. It's an emergency for the welfare of the entire nation. He's not going to wait to give them da'wah and until they hear the message of Allah, then they should hear what this dream means. Because the way you think about an individual is not the same way you think about a community. When you have a community's concern in front of you, their worldly well-being even. This is all about their worldly well-being. That well-being immediately takes precedence. In fact, in the Qur'an, when we give to the poor, when we help the miskeen, when we, when we give to those that are in need in society, Allah did not put a condition on us, give them da'wah first. In fact, when we feed, Allah says, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ We're feeding you for, to, to meet Allah's face. In other words, we're not, feeding, we're not giving you food to preach to you. We're giving you food because we should give you food, because you, you're hungry. That's why. And we're not doing it for you, we're doing it we, so we can meet Allah. The one who put food in our bellies is going to be asking us. So that's why we're doing it. There's no ulterior motive, except public service is a motive by itself. And it's a prophetic mandate. It's so powerful that at an individual level, he got to know them and gave them some da'wah. But at societal level, when something impacts all of society, you, he put his da'wah to the side. And he took the revelation that Allah gave him, and the revelation was what this dream means, and he gave it to them directly. And the next couple of ayat are extremely, the way you can talk, think about them is, they're just secular ayat. He's not telling them to pray. He's not going to tell them to make istighfar. He's not telling them to go back to Allah. Nothing. Listen to this. What does Yusuf salam say? Qala, he said, Tazra'una sab'a sinina da'aban. You are going to crop, you are going to farm seven straight years. Da'aban means back to back to back. Meaning, you better not let a day go to waste. You need, and you, you are going to do this. By the way, what's the difference between do this and you're, go, you're doing it? Do this and you're doing it. Let me put this in simple English for you. I have a, a child in the house and I say, uh, go to the garage. Go to the garage and get me, a, get me the bottle. Okay, that's there on the side. Go, go to the garage and get me a bottle. What's the difference between saying go to the garage and say, you're going to the garage and you're getting me a bottle right now. You are going. Not go, you are going. Now, grammatically, when I say go, that's a command. That's called the imperative verb. When I say you are going, that's actually a statement of fact. Right? Because if you were going, I'd say, hey, you are going. Right? Sometimes you give a command in the language of facts. Like when you say to somebody, you're not going anywhere. Instead of saying, don't go anywhere, what do you say? You're not going anywhere. You know what that means? That means it is so certain that you will obey this command, it's a matter of fact. You speak with such authority that you don't say don't go, you say you're not going. Full stop. You even add a full stop. You don't even put exclamation mark. Even though you mean 18 exclamation marks, you say full stop too. Okay? Now, what's happening here? Tazra'una. You are going to farm seven years, back to back. The aban also means with relentlessly, meaning... When one of you gets tired, the other one takes over. There is no time to rest. You need to crop, you need to lay the seeds out in all of the land as much as possible without taking breaks. Everybody needs to get to work and do everything they can to farm night and day. This is a state of emergency, and this needs to continue relentlessly for how long? Seven years. Basically, he's telling an entire country to drop everything else and put, put themselves to work seven days a week, day and night, exhaust themselves. Is that how nations work? Can you tell a nation to do that? No. And if, even if you could force a nation to do something like that, you would have to have military control over it. You would have to have governmental power over it. So the fact that he's speaking like this, almost as if he's speaking as if he's the government. The tone he's taking is very authoritative. It's very commanding. He's, he knows what he's talking about. You are going to be laying crop for seven years, nonstop, and whatever you harvest at the end of the seasons, whatever grows, leave it inside the stalks. Leave it inside the ear. Because you know when you peel the corn? So leave the peels on. Don't peel it. 
whatever you grow, leave it inside the peel. It's peel. Illa qalilan mimma ta'kulun, except a little from which you are going to eat. It's also interesting. Stop eating a lot. You're going to see a lot of crop. You're going to see the fridge full, but eat very little. And don't, don't, don't unpack the rest of it. Leave it there. He's commanding, the, and he said, Daruhu, you leave it. Leave it in its stock. Accept the little that you're going to eat. And the little from which you're going to eat. Meaning, eat very, very little. Learn to eat less and conserve and save and save and save for seven whole years. For seven whole years. This is what you call a conservative economic policy. <laughs> you're going to see a lot of money coming in. You're going to see a lot of food coming in. You, just like nowadays, you see a huge giant you know, fridge or you, you go to the grocery store and you see you, you're in the mood for one slice of cake. But they don't sell you a slice of cake. They sell you the entire cake and you're like, you know, you want the whole thing. So what if the rest of it will go to waste? I got my slice. Or you have this, the want of more. Gluttony. He says, no, you're going to have to store as much as possible. And you're going to work extra hard. You want me to work extra hard and eat extra less? What is this? It's the only way to survive. That's the policy I'm giving you. And you got to do this for seven straight years. And after that, there are going to be seven extremely difficult years. Wait, I thought those were hard because we were working hard. No, you were working hard to get ready for the actually hard years. Seven intensely difficult years are coming. Listen to the language. Those seven years are going to eat up everything you prepared for them. It's interesting. Not you're going to eat up what you prepared. The seven years are going to eat up what you prepared for them. You know how you say, man, this year was very profitable. Right? Or this year was very damaging. Or this year ate up all my savings. The last two months ate up all my money. Sometimes we use the word time to describe as if it's a person eating something, using something, right? So time eats away too. And he's now telling us how Allah taught him to interpret the dream. The, cow, the skinny cows represents starving people and starving times. The fat cows have been eating real well, so they're stored up on the fat. And the skinny ones are going to eat the fat that's left over on the fat ones. And it's interesting that cows were used because cows are a representation of farming. Isn't it? And, immediate, and without cows, you can't really farm because you can't irrigate the land. And then the next part of the dream is, is the stalks, which is directly farming. And seven of them are you know, green and seven of them are dried up, which means seven years you're going to grow. And seven years you're not going to grow at all. Nothing's going to grow. So those seven green ones are going to be the ones that save you when, the, when everything is dried up. So he interprets this dream and he lays it out to this inmate and the inmate's listening, listening carefully. And he's probably memorizing it because we know he's good at memorizing. He's got good memory. We, that's already been established. So he's telling him what it means. And he says, and seven years, intense ones that will eat away everything that you have prepared for them, except the very little that you're going to be able to preserve. So you're going to have very little savings left at the end of those seven years. If you implement this now, if you don't start saving extremely now and eating less, you're all going to starve. Now, in the dream, there were seven cows, then seven cows, then seven stocks, then seven stocks. Seven plus seven is how many? Fourteen. And Yusuf salam just said, seven good years followed by... Seven bad years. That means the dream interpretation is done. Right? I told you what the first seven are going to be. I told you what the next seven are going to be. Listen to this. After that, immediately there will be another year in which people are going to be rained on. Plenty of rain will come on the people. And it also means there, there will be a year. Agatha means Allah's help for God's help to descend. Meaning, there will be a year in which Allah's help will descend onto people. And in that year, they are going to squeeze. Meaning, they're going to squeeze milk out of the cows. They're going to squeeze wine out of the grapes. They're going to squeeze juice out of the fruits. They're going to squeeze oil out of the olives. They're going to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. Meaning, there's 
plenty to go around. And squeezing also suggests the coming out of liquid, right? And liquid can only come out when there's no drought. Let's go back to farming language. 70 years where the rivers are running free, there's irrigation, that's why you can crop. Seven years where the rains stop, the rivers dry up, there's no water to go around. And then one year, one year, that's going to come immediately after. That's going to be so amazing that it's, people are going to get rained on plenty. And ghaith in Arabic means not, you know, sometimes it rains, but not enough. Right? So it doesn't really feed the earth as it should have been fed. Sometimes it rains too much, it becomes a flood. But when the rain is perfect, that it, the, the earth swallows it and gives you exactly what it should have produced, and it's in just the right amount, that's called ghaith. And that's why we have the prayer called Salatul Istighatha from the same origin. The prayer of perfect rain. The rain that's going to be just right. He says there's going to be a year after these 14, year number what now? 15. That's going to be unusually amazing. It's going to be perfect rain that year. You know, some, even right, right now, regular years, some good years, some bad years, it's a mix. Right? Now, the, the, the few things to note here, number one, did the king even mention something in his dream that could tell you about a 15th year? No. So the information about the 15th year is coming directly from Allah. Then somebody might argue, fine, if you say there's seven good years, followed by seven bad years, then obviously that means year number 15 is going to be good. But the thing with that is, when you have drought for seven years, even if things start turning around, hey man, it rained twice last year. That's, a, that's better. Next year, maybe it'll be a whole three times. Maybe in a few years, they'll get five or six. It's never going to go back to the way it used to be, right? It's been seven years we haven't seen a climate change like that. He says, no, right after those seven years are done, it's going to be like heaven on earth. And you guys are going to be living it up. You're going to be squeezing and basically you're going to become lax. You don't have to worry about drink anymore. You don't have to worry about the limited resources of, of liquid anymore. You know, whether it comes from fruits or animals or whatever else, there's plenty to drink. There's plenty to go around. And when he gave this 15th year, the thing is, Allah did not just reveal to him the meaning of the dream. Allah revealed to him, additional to what he was asked, something that wasn't even asked. Now, why is that significant? You could say, first of all, this year is going to be unusually good. Maybe after that 15th year, year 16, 17, 18, and so on, are going to be normal years. Some good, some bad mixture, right? But this is like an unusually good year. Isn't he asking for society to go on lockdown for seven years? Isn't he asking for resources to be limited? Even though there's plenty of resources to go around and the economy is good, we got to act like an emergency is on the way. And we have to preserve for a coming emergency. How many years before the emergency comes? Seven. And if this was an election year, and it was the first year, the politician would have said, you want us to wait six years and hurt our economy? And, not, and we can't eat food because these people want to limit our freedom? We can't eat? What kind of policy is this? Seven years. We don't have the patience for seven years. We're dying over here. I want to eat twice the food I eat right now. I, in other words, he gave a policy that makes, or, you know, that expects public responsibility. The, the, entire, the entire nation has to chip in and realize this is for the collective well-being. In this also embedded is kind of a philosophy of government, the economic policies of government. How so? You see, as an individual in Islam, I'm not encouraged to save and save and save and save and save. Like, I'm going to save for seven years because there might be seven bad years. Because Allah even criticizes الذي جمع مالا وعدده The one who gathers money and keeps on counting it. يحسب أن ماله أخلده The one who thinks that his money is going to make him live forever. As an individual, when I have, even Allah encourages in some places, قل العفو Tell them what should they spend. Whatever extra you have, just keep giving. Be charitable. Right? But that's for the individual. For the society, you have to think about the worst times and not act when the economy is doing well, don't start wasting government funds on projects that don't matter. Prepare for the national emergency where people might end up starving. 
So you have enough money to go around where you don't have to fight tooth and nail to bail people out so they can have food on the table. Because you were prepared for such an emergency because you had responsible economic policies. You saved properly. You understand? So he created, the, and when he, the economy is good, nobody wants to be conservative. When you have a lot of money in the, like, take, give you the example of a kid. When my parents used to give me money for Eid, I got like a 20 or 30 in my pocket. Man, I'm looking at the candy store. And I'm, like, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that too. I never tried that one. Usually, I'd get maybe one thing and be happy for a few days. But now I got money. More. And that 30 bucks will disappear within the next 10 minutes. Because I'm not thinking like an adult, am I? Right? Now the thing is, our, we always thought when we were kids, our parents would always tell us, you can't get this toy, you can't buy that, you can't go there, no, we can't go there tonight, we can't go get this restaurant. No, no, no. I remember going to restaurants where we shared a burger, the whole family. We couldn't, you know, afford a, more than a burger sometimes. It happened. And I'm proud of those moments. You know why? Because the head of a household has to think about the entire budget for the month. He has to think about the electricity bill. He has to think about the school tuition. He has to think about the backpacks. He has to think about the new socks. He has to think about the toothbrushes and the toothpaste and the cereal. And, and the kids just said, but you didn't let me get the toy. Because a child is not responsible for anyone but themselves. When an entire society becomes a society of children, and the people running that government act like children too, and nobody's thinking about the future that's coming, nobody's thinking ahead, then there's a disaster on the way. Yusuf says, times may be good, but prepare for the worst. But know that the worst of it, and the worst of it may be as bad as the good. So seven good versus seven bad. But don't be hopeless. Listen, at the end of the, this, is, this can only come from Allah. Right now we're in the middle of a crisis all over the world. There's an economic crisis. There's a political crisis. There's all kinds of crises around us. And you know what? One of the things that we're asking, when is this going to be over? When is this going to be over? And we don't have the answer to that. But Yusuf salam, in the case of his economic you know, news of seven years of a breakdown of society, of the entire economy collapsing because ancient Egypt, an agricultural society, is going to lose water. What are they going to have left if they don't have water? And he says, but no, hold your breath for how long? Seven years. And after seven years, there's going to be a day that's going to feel like heaven. So when they're year six, we can have a celebration. Six more years to go. And there's a big, you know, timer. Five more years, man. Five more years. I can't wait. Because there's a deadline at the end, right? We don't have that advantage, do we? We can't say, man, three more months and watch. It's all over. We can't do that. And by the way, if you have a clear deadline, then it becomes easier to be patient with the time left. If you don't have a deadline, then like, when is this going to end? You know what? It's never going to end. So might as well just go crazy. Might as well just act like it's not happening now. Act irresponsibly, responsibly now. You understand? So he gave this remarkably mature policy that laid out what the next 15 years are going to look like. As I leave you with this, this, and by the way, that again, the news of relief could only have come from Allah. So this statement, the, the way in which he is describing it, people are going to be replenished. Let people know there's hope. It's not all bad. But they need to get through it. And those people include believers, disbelievers, whatever society. Because even his family is going to be starving, by the way. His own family is going to be starving. When he gave this policy and he told this, you know, this, this cup bearer, he didn't say again, can you mention me now, please? Can you at least mention me now? Didn't say it. You know why? Because when the cup bearer, a.k.a. the bartender, goes back, and tells the king verbatim what he memorized. Because he's going to do, do that, right? We know that already he's going to do that. Why? Because he did that with the king. So when he word for word repeats what Yusuf salam, said, the king is smart enough to know, where'd you get this? And he's not going to say, I can't reveal my sources, sir, but I'll take the promotion. He's going to have to say, uh, someone I know. Who? Who do you know? Who is this person? I need to meet this person. Because the moment the king hears this interpretation, the king is going to feel like, I think that's, I feel like that's right. The king could reject this interpretation, can't he? 
But my reading of this, Allahu A'lam, is that when the king hears this interpretation, even the king's going to be like, that's exactly what I think it is. Where did you get this? Uh, uh, I asked you a question. Uh, Yusuf. Who? Yusuf who? He's in jail. He was falsely in prison. <laughs> All of it's going to come out, isn't it? It's, the guy thinks prematurely that he's going to get a promotion. It's going to backfire. And Yusuf salam knows the intelligence with which he presented it. The clarity with which he presented it would speak for itself. Which is a powerful lesson. We're not even doing that next time. We're up to 49. But it's a powerful lesson by itself. You see, imitation is not, they say imitation is the highest form of flattery. If you're doing, if you're excelling in something, if you're doing your very best in something, don't worry about somebody taking the credit for what you're doing or copying you and getting away with it. Because when they're copying you, they're only actually promoting you without realizing it. They don't even know it. They, they don't know it. All those imitations are simply there to actually validate what you're doing more. Because if you weren't worth copying, they wouldn't be doing it. And you know what? If they try to do something of value, some of genuine good for them, there's more reward for you. And if they're not able to, people will see right through it and say, that doesn't sound like it's originally yours. Where'd you get it from? Where'd that come from? I'll go to the source. You can, you can copy somebody, and maybe you're really good at copying, but you can only fake it so long. There's no fake it till you make it. You'll be fake it till you break it. That's, that's what happens. And eventually it'll break. You can't, Pretend you can't take credit for other people's work. Well, you habbuna and yuhmadu bima lam yafalu. Quran says about people, some people they love to be praised for something they haven't even done. That which is the character that's being kind of described here. He wanted to be praised for something he didn't do. And Yusuf alayhi salam realized that I don't have to promote myself. I don't have to make my case anymore. I've lost that hope anyway. This guy can't be expected to do anything. I'm too. Uh, he's too mature to ask that question again because he knows that's a bottomless pit. There's no point wasting my breath on that. But Yusuf Ali Salam knows something else too. That when you excel, your excellence will speak for you. Even if people don't speak for you. If people forget you. If people dismiss you. You'll, Allah will make your work speak for you. Allah will make your truth speak for you. And in this case, the, the gift Allah has given him, the revelation Allah gave him, will speak for him. That's actually what's going to rescue him. Not this guy. Not the cupbearer. It's actually the... His, and why did he tell the cupbearer this dream? This is the last thing I'll share with you. It's subtle but important to mention. He did not tell the cupbearer the interpretation of the dream because he knows that when he goes back and he tells the dream, it's going to be so impressive that he's going to get out of jail. He said this interpretation because people are going to die. And he can do something about it. So he didn't talk about his case, he didn't talk about being freed, he just said straight, he didn't say, I will tell you what it means, but let me out of here first. Could he, done that? Could he have done that? Absolutely. But he understands that Allah has put him in a position to do good for people, to be from the muhsineen, to look out for the benefit of others, even if they're not looking to his benefit. Because when he goes in front of Allah, if somebody was benefiting me or not, won't matter. But if I benefited somebody else, that will matter. That's going to be an asset in my record. In my record, so he'll rake in the rewards and he'll help immediately. And he understands that this is an emergency. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than my case. All of us are going to starve. Nobody's going to have food left. So this needs to be taken care of right now. Go take back this. Take this back to people. I would imagine Yusuf Ali was even given a revelation that it is in fact the king. The way he talked, he knew that he's giving government policies. I mean, the, the language is making it clear that he's he's not just talking to a farmer. He's talking to everybody. And the only way you can talk to everybody is you have one microphone that speaks to everyone, and that must be the microphone of the king. There's no other way. Right? So he issues this. He lays it out. So, you know, I, I've talked to you about a few things today, but, you know, uh, there are different kinds of governments in the world today, different kinds of economies. But particularly in the case of e ancient Egypt, it's clear that the farmland was under the control of the government, under the king. Because right, he decides what to crop, what to be, etc. Right, so it's basically this this uh, monarchy in which the land is owned by the king, and the people work on the land, but they don't own the land. It seems that way, right? And if and if that is the case, 
then what we're referring to as an analogy is governmental resources. Those are governmental resources. And the government has to be extremely careful in where it spends its resources. Otherwise, it brings about disaster onto people. Even if it's not a disaster today, it might be a disaster 10 years from now, 20 years from now. It's incredible that without revelation, there can be projections about a coming virus that may become a pandemic, and we might need the kind of medical resources that can handle large populations. And studies were done on this stuff. Reports were presented to, about this stuff to state governments, to federal governments around the world, including the United States, and no action was taken on it. No action was taken. And yet, budgets for weapons of mass destruction keep increasing. Right? This is how governments spend money. And this is Yusuf salam's insight, Quranic insight, on what a government should be doing. Even in good times when there's no crisis in sight. Because you should foresee a crisis coming for the benefit of the people, to secure the people. That's the job of a government. That's the job of a government. And so he, sitting in a jail cell, he gave us this most incredible, timeless policy measure that can be a savior to nations around the world, not just ancient Egypt. Just in, in these few words. So with that, inshallah, I'll leave you with some, with some of your own reflections on these few ayat. And tomorrow, bismillah, we're going to start talking about his return out of prison. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr hakim Actually, I changed my mind. Tomorrow, I won't talk about his return from prison. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk to you about the fact that we're at the halfway point, And I might have a shorter session tomorrow and talk to you about some outstanding reflections on Surat Yusuf up until now. There's some things that I observed that I didn't mention in my series that I want to bring up to you up until, because we've reached basically the halfway point. Um, and this halfway point, not in the number of ayat, but in the progression of the story. Yeah. So everything that happens now is basically unraveling all the tension that was built up until now. So there's tension, 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 tension. And then there's the release, 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 release. That's what's going to happen in the rest of this surah. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, bye.